If you make documentary films, you've probably heard about how important it is to avoid saying defamatory things in your documentary so you don't get sued. But how do you avoid saying defamatory things? At a high level, defamation means a false statement about someone that's damaging to their reputation. But as always in the law, the devil is in the details. Uh, for example, I just said that defamation requires a false statement. But what is a statement? That's not always 100% clear in the context of documentary films. Uh, for example, suppose there's a true crime documentary where the narrator uh, is talking about the facts of a gruesome murder and a photo of a random guy who had nothing whatsoever to do with the murders is shown on the screen. Uh, is that the equivalent of the narrator saying that the guy whose photo appeared committed the crime or that he had something to do with it? I mean, in this example, the narrator isn't explicitly coming out and accusing him of committing the crime, but the placement of his photo could be interpreted as implying that, right? That's what I'm going to talk about in this video. Uh, what exactly is a defamatory statement in the context of a documentary film, and how do you avoid making one? Uh, I'm going to use lawsuits involving two Netflix true crime documentaries to illustrate the points I'm making here. Um, one of them is Making a Murderer, and the other one is The Hatchet-Wielding Hitchhiker. But first, a couple of disclaimers, because of course we attorneys can't resist disclaiming things. First, what I'm about to tell you is not legal advice, because if I were going to give you legal advice, I'd need to understand your specific situation and needs, and right now I'm just a random lawyer talking to you on the internet. And second, uh, I'm going to be talking about matters of U.S. law. So if you're making your film outside the United States, or if your production company is based outside the United States, then the legal concepts that I talk about in this video might not apply to you. And finally, before we jump in, if you find this content valuable, please like this video and subscribe to this channel so I can keep providing this kind of educational content to enterprising, hungry, young filmmakers such as yourself. Now, so back to the question that we're talking about in this video. Uh, how do you determine whether a documentary makes a potentially defamatory statement about someone? Let's look first at making a murderer. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen this series. It was very popular and it won a bunch of awards. It's about a guy in Wisconsin, Stephen Avery, who was convicted of some violent crimes and imprisoned in 1985, but he was exonerated 18 years later using DNA evidence. Later in 2005, he was prosecuted and arrested again for murder, and two years afterwards he was convicted again and sentenced to life. Uh, one of the officers involved in investigating Avery uh, in connection with the murder charge was named Andrew Colborn. At Avery's murder trial, Avery's attorneys cross-examined Colborn and basically accused him of planting evidence because he and the other county officials were allegedly upset about Avery walking free. Uh, the Netflix documentary used about 10 minutes of Colborn's testimony during the murder trial. In a couple of instances, the documentary played some ominous music while Colborn was on the screen. According to Colborn, the documentary also used footage of him in the trial that made him look nervous. The filmmakers also interviewed some people who were critical of the police department and the prosecution of Avery generally, although none of them specifically claimed that Colborn planted evidence or otherwise did anything that was objectionable. Uh, after the documentary series became popular, Colborn started to get unpleasant phone calls and letters from people who had watched the series, and they decided that he was responsible for basically putting an innocent man in prison. Uh, he sued Netflix, claiming that the documentary made defamatory statements about him. The judge granted what's called summary judgment, which basically means that the plaintiff, Colborn, didn't provide enough evidence of defamation to justify bringing the case to trial. When it came to the sinister music that the documentary played on some occasions when Colborn was on the screen, the judge ruled that playing music in and of itself is not the same thing as a defamatory statement. It may be a typical technique in narrative films for the antagonist to have his own evil-sounding music motif, but playing music when someone's on the screen is not the same thing as accusing them of evidence tampering or, or, or some kind of other bad conduct. Similarly, uh, using footage of Colborn that made him look nervous, the judge ruled, wasn't a defamatory statement either. Uh, just showing Colborn's body language at the trial wouldn't imply to a reasonable person that Colborn was lying or that he engaged in any kind of misconduct. Uh, next, the judge ruled, although the filmmakers interviewed some people who suggested that Avery had been railroaded, uh, none of those people specifically mentioned Colborn. And so, even assuming their statements about the merits of the second prosecution of Avery were false, the statements didn't defame Colborn. Uh, this brings us to an important point about defamation law, which is called the oven concerning doctrine. In other words, to defame the plaintiff, a statement has to specifically be about the plaintiff and not just some group of people that he's part of, like a police department. Finally, and also importantly, the judge ruled that there were certain statements made in the documentary that were not defamatory because they were opinions and not facts. Uh, for example, in one clip, Avery's attorney says, I think I know why he did, uh, referring to a report that Colborn wrote the day after Avery was released from prison for the crimes he was originally convicted of. Uh, Colborn claimed 
that Avery's attorney was suggesting that Colborn wrote his report because he was determined to get Avery convicted by any means necessary. Uh, the judge noted that the lawyer's statement was nothing but unsupported speculation. After all, the lawyer said, I think I know why, uh, suggesting that he was stating a theory or a hypothesis and not a fact. Uh, and the lawyer didn't elaborate on why he thought Colborn wrote the report to retaliate against Avery for his initial release. Uh, pure speculation is considered to be opinion for the purposes of defamation law, and an opinion can't be defamatory. If the lawyer had said something like, the evidence showed that Colborn wrote the report to take revenge on Avery, the outcome might have been a little different. Uh, that is, the judge might have found that what the attorney said was a statement of fact and not opinion, and therefore capable of being defamatory. Uh, as a side note, this might raise an interesting question for you. How could Netflix be liable for a statement by Avery's attorney that it put in the film? After all, it was the attorney and not Netflix that made the statement, right? All that Netflix did was put that statement in the series. The answer is that for the purposes of defamation law, when you put someone's statement in your film, you're considered to be quote unquote republishing it. And you're just as liable for defamation as the person who made the statement may be. That's something that's very important for filmmakers to keep in mind. Now, likewise, Netflix itself didn't actually make the documentary Making a Murderer, right? It was the filmmakers and Netflix only distributed it. But by distributing it, uh, Netflix republished the documentary for defamation purposes, and it was just as liable as the filmmakers for any defamation that it might have contained. Uh, anyway, what lessons can the judge's ruling teach us about avoiding defamation in the context of a documentary film? First, you probably can't defame someone just by using sinister sounding music and sound effects that could be interpreted to suggest that they're a bad person. So you don't have to worry very much about that aspect of your post-production. Second, if a statement in your film isn't specifically about a person, it can't defame them. If you say that uh, the Manitowoc Police Department had an in for Stephen Avery, individual members of the police department probably couldn't sue you and claim that you had defamed them in your film. Uh, third, if someone gives an opinion in a documentary, that is, if it's clear that they're just speculating and throwing out ideas and not trying to state a fact, uh, that can't be defamatory either. Now let's talk about the hatchet-wielding hitchhiker, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum as far as uh, defamatory statements in a documentary are concerned. The hatchet-wielding hitchhiker was about a man, Caleb McGilvery, who received a lot of media attention after he rescued a woman who was being attacked in the street by hitting her assailant with a hatchet. But later, McGilvery was convicted of murdering an elderly man. Uh, in an unrelated series of events, another man, Taylor Hazelwood, had a friend take a photo of him holding a hatchet uh, because Hazelwood thought that he looked like the character on the cover of a book called Hatchet that he had really liked as a kid. Uh, Hazelwood had nothing whatsoever to do with McGilvery or anything that he allegedly did. It's not totally clear from the public documents how this happened, but the documentary puts the photos of McGilvery and Hazelwood side by side, and the voiceover says, is this a guardian angel or a stone cold killer? Uh, there's also a tweet that appears on the screen at the same time saying, you can never trust anyone. Uh, apparently, the filmmakers downloaded a photo from the internet that they thought was McGilvery holding a hatchet, but was actually a completely different guy, Hazelwood. So Hazelwood sued Netflix, claiming that this juxtaposition of his photo with McGilvery's photo and the accompanying language implied that Hazelwood committed the murder that McGilvery was convicted of, and so it was defamatory. Uh, Netflix moved to dismiss the case, which basically means they said to the court that even if everything that Hazelwood said was true, Netflix didn't do anything by distributing the documentary. Uh, the judge denied the motion, so he disagreed with Netflix. There isn't a whole lot of explanation in the judge's order as to why Hazelwood's depiction in the documentary was defamatory, but I think that we can infer a couple of things from the facts that are emphasized by the judge. Uh, the judge pointed to the statement, is this a guardian angel or a stone cold killer that the narrator makes in the documentary? with the photo of Hazelwood on the screen, uh, which I think in the judge's mind could be interpreted to imply that the photo of Hazelwood was actually a picture of McGilvery, or that Hazelwood was associated with the crime that was committed by McGilvery, allegedly, in, in some fashion. I, I suppose that if a person watching the film understood the photo of Hazelwood to be a picture of McGilvery, and they saw Hazelwood out in public or they interacted with him in person, they might call the cops and ask them to arrest Hazelwood or refuse to associate with him, or tell other people, hey, that's the murderer from the Netflix documentary, or, or something along those lines. So you could see how um, that might conceivably damage Hazelwood's reputation. What does this ruling teach us? Um, unlike the Making a Murderer case, which mostly involved sinister music and sound effects and general statements about the police department that the plaintiff was a member of, and broad statements of opinion, this case involved a statement that was clearly about Hazelwood. That is, 
is this a guardian angel or a stone cold killer? It was a statement that was clearly about Hazelwood because his picture was on the screen at the moment that it was set. I, I suppose you could argue that this narrative just asks a question and doesn't explicitly claim that Hazelwood committed the murder that Gilvery was later convicted of. But if you look at the statement in the context of the entire documentary, you can see why a reasonable viewer might take it to be an allegation that Hazelwood committed the murder. Uh, the documentary, after all, is about how McGilvery protected a woman from an assault, that is, he was a quote-unquote guardian angel, but also murdered a man in cold blood, that is, he was a stone-cold killer. So that statement by the narrator wasn't just a question, it was a summary of what the documentary claims that McGilvery did, and that summary is obviously false when it comes to Hazelwood, who had nothing to do with McGilvery or his actions at all. So to sum up, uh, if your film makes a statement that's explicitly about a particular person, like Hazelwood, and that statement turns out to be wrong, that's when you can potentially trigger a defamation lawsuit. If, on the other hand, you just use ominous music or sound effects when someone's on screen, or you show them uh, exhibiting nervous looking body language, or you just make a general statement about a group of which they're a member, like the police department, you're not at as much risk for litigation. I hope this has been helpful to you in understanding how to protect yourself from defamation liability in your documentary filmmaking. Uh, if you have any questions about defamation law that I didn't answer in this video, feel free to ask them in the comments section. And thanks for watching.